Yo, what's going on YouTube? What's going on Celtics Nation? Welcome back to another episode of Vitamin C's. I'm your boy Adam Taylor. I'm joined by my homie, my compadre, my boy, Mr. Tim Shields. Before we get into this episode, please make sure that you go and hit that like button, that subscribe button, and leave a dope-ass comment for us. And that's about all we need you to do. We want to grow. We need you to help us grow. Then we can give you even more content. We can do some really cool stuff. And everybody's winning. Tim, what's going on, my homie? Uh, to be honest, been okay. The weekend kind of sucked because we had about two feet of snow in the uh, New England area. So anyone rough, around the area, rough, it was rough, man. I It's the biggest snowstorm in a while. Nasty blizzard. The worst part was like you go out, you shovel a foot, and you go out like a couple hours later. Just snow just, 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 just right back where it was. Just I got no, another I saw, foot. But I saw other than video, that. Dude. I saw a video on Twitter. <laughs> And there's two dudes like in, in, somewhere in in Massachusetts, and they're like walking around. They've got the, the snow goggles on. They're all wrapped up warm. And some reporter must have stopped them, like asking them what they think about Tom Brady. It was when Tom Brady's retirement had leaked. Whether or not that's true is for somebody else to debate. But the dudes like at the end of the interview, he's like, "What are you guys doing out in this weather? Where are you going?" And they're like, "Hey, man, we're just trying to find an open Dunkin' Donuts." <laughs> So I was like, that is the most Boston thing I could possibly think of, dude. Like, uh, we don't care what the weather is. Where's the donkeys? Where's get the me donkeys? to the donkeys. Yeah, get me to a donkeys. I got this gift factory expired. <laughs> Let me get to a donkeys, dude. I'm like, damn, if I was in Boston right now, I'd be going to a donkeys too. It's a different level of desperation that I cannot relate to. <laughs> I mean, I fly halfway across the world just to go to a Dunkin' Donuts. I think I understand that level of desperation. I pay imports <laughs> and the coffee. All right, Look, fair. <laughs> get me the donkeys, dude. And if anyone's watching from Dunkin' Donuts, you want to ask me to be a brand ambassador, I can do that for you. Hit me up on Twitter. You can see it there. We'll make a deal. We'll make the kit work. I'd be extremely grateful. I don't know whether you would be. <laughs> right, so the episode, <laughs> they should be. I mean, you know, let's open them all over England and uh, we can have a good time. So anyway, before we go down a food and drink discussion, which I'm prone to do, you know, I like coffee. I like food. Let's talk about some basketball. So what we're going to do today is I know we've focused heavily on the trade deadline and we will do some more on that too, but we're just going to kind of take a little bit of a different approach today. We're going to look at that Marcus Smart interview he had with Jay King. Jay King's awesome. Everybody should be following Jay King by now over at The Athletic. The interview, a lot of people ran with one very specific quote. What was that quote, Tim? Would you like to read that quote verbatim? So this is specifically, if you haven't read the article, this is probably the one quote you've seen circulating. And I think it is important that you definitely read the article, not only because Jay King's a great writer, but because there's way more context that's getting missed in here. But context. this is the quote from Smart. Give me I've been challenged from Ime, everybody else, that I'm not the person, the right person in this position to do it, even though every time I go out there, I do it and it shows. And before this, he had said, as a point guard, when everybody else is going scattered, you have to kind of be the one to calm everyone back down. So this comment, this is Jay King, the comment wasn't based on anything Udoka has said, Smart later explained to The Athletic, but a feeling Smart got based on the head coach's approach this season. He didn't say it directly, but he didn't say it, in, he didn't say it indirectly, Smart said in Atlanta. I took it as that because I didn't hear him say that the role was for me and anybody's going to take it that way. It's just more fuel for you to go out there and just continue to prove everybody wrong. I mean, so the first thing you got to realize is the, the things you don't say speak louder than the things you do say. Like, I'm a big believer in that, you know, um, as somebody that's studying literature degree right now, one of the biggest things you get taught early on is the things you don't add to a story are the things that mean the most to that story. You know, you you open it up to, to personal interpretation, to conjecture, blah, blah, blah. And it's exactly the same thing in this instance. Smart's kind of like, yo, you never said it was for me, but you said you needed someone to do it. And you've put me in the position where realistically that should be what I need to do. But you haven't explicitly said, yo, Smart, that's for you to do. So I can see why he'd take it that way for sure. I mean, I saw a bunch of people run with, oh, there could be a potential rift here. You know, maybe Udoka and Smart aren't seeing eye to eye. I don't think it's that at all. I do think that I know coming into the season that I had and I saw a bunch of concerns like, you know, Udoka's a very strong personality. Um, call it, say it how I see it. And then I, Marcus Smart, we know he's a very strong personality. He says how he sees it. There was always the potential 
for these two to clash at some point this season. And I think because of the struggles that the Celtics have been having on the court, that kind of narrative fell by the wayside early and never really got picked back up. But there is definitely a, a world where these two guys clash consistently. And there's a world where they become kind of like brothers in arms type of thing, you know what I mean? And they really buy into each other's like motivations and they really thrive off each other. I, I haven't seen any evidence to either of those things right now. Smart seems to be bought into the system. He's playing some of the best basketball of his career, if you ask me, in terms of actually playing within the flow of an offense and obviously his defensive stuff. But like, I'm not buying into this rift, not yet anyway. I, I definitely don't think there's a rift either. I think also part of it, just based on the chatter that we've seen around Marcus Smart and the, just the overall rhetoric of can he be the point guard for the Celtics, he's kind of taking a lot of this noise as a slight. So like any kind of just inkling of doubt or any kind of potential slight is being viewed directly as a slight, directly as something that he's going to use as motivation, as bullet like bullet bulletin board material. And so for Smart specifically right now, he's saying a lot of stuff that I'm finding like timing-wise is very funky. He talked about after one of the games or before the game actually. He said it in his post-game presser, but he's talking about before the game where he gathered everyone else like in the tunnel saying, I love you guys, loves his teammates, specifically spoke to Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, saying how much he loves and supports them and wants them to thrive. Mentioning this in a post-game presser, and I think it was leading into the day where he's trade eligible, then at the last game, uh, which would be at this point now, by the time you guys hear this. Yeah. So talking about glass still being in his hands. So if anyone remembers, as you should, Marcus Smart a few years back punched a picture frame after a tough loss. And there's still glass in his hand. And they've talked about this before. They've talked about it previously, but I personally forgot. But there are still pieces of glass in his hand. And he talks about it before his interview saying, oh, yeah, you know, sometimes I lose the feeling in my hand. And they can't take it out because of where it is the tendon. So the doctors just left it in. But it's really weird. Like there's just been a couple of weird, funky things that keep coming out from Smart or about Smart. And it's just, it's weird. Like I don't know what to make of it other than the fact of, Everyone feels like there's potential that he could get traded or just no one is safe on the Celtics roster outside of the Jays and Robert Williams. Like, it's just this weird, funky vibe of, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just looking too far into the tea leaves. Maybe I'm on the same level as Marcus, just overthinking things. Marcus, I mean, for the first, like, my first, like, like where am I going to take this? Okay, so the first thing I want to say is we all knew there was already glass still in his hand. If you followed that storyline from the beginning, you knew that they left that piece of glass in there. That's not a revelation. The revelation for me was like, yo, sometimes my hand goes numb. You know what I mean? Like, some, like it'll just go numb for a while and then the feeling will come back. And I'm like, well, that don't bode well. No, because as you get older, that's, that's going to start to set in more. It's going to become arthritic. You Obviously, you're not going to look to get the glass removed until the end of your career because there could be problems with the tendons and the, the motor functions in that hand. So there's going to be times where he's going to miss games at some point or another because his hand starts playing up. And, you know, fair enough. We've all hit stuff when, we're in a, when we've kind of had a bad day. You know, I say we all. I, I've hit a lot of stuff when I've had a bad day, you know, especially when you're younger and you just a bit aggressive and you lash out. It happens. It's part of being young. Um, in terms of his comments, like I get it. You know, I can see how they've been construed in a, oh, this is Smart's kind of goodbye to everybody, right? You know, like, oh, man. Because when you watch that press conference back, he looks subdued. Bearing in mind, he's just played, like, an entire NBA game of high intensity, high skill level. Like, you're tired, dude dehydrated, probably hungry. You know, not everybody's Giannis and can walk into a press conference with a big bucket of chicken wings and just start eating <laughs> while people are, you know, not everyone's afforded that type of luxury, man. Some has got to wait till they get out of the arena. So you might be hungry, but I get it. But then on the other side of things, like maybe this is just his way of trying a different form of leadership. You know what I'm saying? Maybe he's just changing his uh, modus operandi. Is that right? Modus operandi. M.O.? Well, yeah. yeah, you're you're right. <laughs> yeah, maybe he's just changing his mo, dude. And he's like, "Yo, we've got like because up until this point, Brad Stevens has always been the guy that's been the empathetic leader. He's the one that's shown empathy to his team. 
or at least in the media, he's definitely been the most empathetic. Now you've got somebody like Udoka that's far more volatile, far more bristly with his, with his players. You know, you see maybe Smart's like, hey, I don't need to be that guy so much now. Maybe I try and do the you can catch more flies with honey approach. And by me telling these guys I love them and I believe in them, maybe that's my way of saying to these guys, like, yo, whatever you need to do, I'm going to be there for you and I've got your back 100%. And, I mean, they went out and won that game. You know what I mean? And Tatum went on a heater early. So maybe, it, you know, it's just different different ways of leadership. Smart's getting older, so maybe he's mellowing out that little bit. You know, you didn't got to be angry. You didn't got to be hard all the time. So I, I kind of took it like that. I just took it as maybe he's exploring different styles of leadership and seeing what clicks around the team. Because at the end of the day, with or without the title of captain, that's his role. And I think we all accept that. We all acknowledge it. And that means he needs to find the best way to get through to these guys. And if that means you've got to be a little bit more lovey-dovey and a little bit softer with these guys, so be it, man. I ain't got to see it. Yeah, and I think ultimately we've seen him become a really good playmaker this season. I don't think there's been any kind of defensive drop-off. He's still obviously having a really tough time shooting. I think when he gets inside and is driving to the paint, he's an excellent finisher. But his judgments improved vastly. And you could tell, like, there was definitely some kind of turning point in this season where he realized what role he needed to play for this team. And to be fair, he's the longest tenured Celtic on the roster. Uh, he's one of the older players here. He's been here under Brad Stevens. He was drafted into the system under Brad Stevens and has been here with the Jays probably the longest. The only other guy who comes close to that is Al Horford. And even then, you know, he was gone for a few years. Marcus Smart's been here consistently. So maybe this is a process, a part of him maturing and figuring out what he is. And, and what he also talked in the Jay King article was, I was a point guard. I was a point guard in high school. I led my team to two state championships. Like, I, I'm familiar with that role. I'm familiar being a distributor. And maybe part of it's also been, you look at the way the Celtics have constructed over the past few years. He's been relegated to being that two guard. Like, when you're putting him out there, you want Marcus Smart in your closing lineups. You want him to be ideally one of those guys that's going to be in your starting five. And he's almost always being put at the two guard spot. And while we've kind of learned this season, especially with Dennis Schroeder, he cannot play two guard. He has to be the guy who is a primary facilitator, a primary ball handler. He's really good at finding his guys in rhythm, getting out and running, pushing the pace. He doesn't roll the ball up the court. You know, he pushes that tempo. So, Maybe this is kind of his way of blossoming into that role. And, and I agree. Maybe it's a different approach to leadership. Maybe it's just a sign of him maturing and realizing, hey, I have to take a, a advantage of the opportunity that's here. I have to maximize the window that we have with these guys. And Brown and Tatum right now playing some of the best basketball the Celtics have seen in a while out of two stars. And you just don't get that opportunity very often. So if he's trying to make the most out of it and he's trying to make his stamp known, then I'm for it. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Smart is he isn't a two-guard, but he isn't a one either. He's a combo guard. That's the best way to describe Marcus, but he's definitely more of a facilitating combo guard. And, you know, you heard all the the rumors about these crazy passes he hits in training, all these, like, ridiculous cross-court pitches he throws, and he sees things quicker than a lot of the guys. And we just never got an opportunity to see that because Kemba Walker was there, Kyrie Irving was there, Isaiah Thomas was there. You know, you see all this... And you, you do have to kind of sit back now and at the minute it's very much a, a show me season for Marcus Smart. Show me this you can do this role and play it the way we need to. Now the thing about Smart compared to a lot of the other guys, uh, the other guards that the Celtics have had and potential guards the Celtics could kind of cover would probably be the best word. Um, Smart can play out of the post and he's shown that he can facilitate out of the post to a high level, especially for somebody of his size and build. He's super strong, uh, really good low center of gravity when he gets his hips down and he's facilitating fantastically out of the post. I even wrote an article about it simply because I'm impressed with the way that, you know, he was, there was one possession he set across screen for Tate and went straight into the post, got the ball, Tate and curled off the weak side above the perimeter smart fed him tatum fed smart back because the defense had caught up to him relocated smart hit smart took two dribbles towards the paint backing down his guy drew two and then hit tatum again for the open three you know like not many point guards are going to have their back to the basket on the mid block mid to low block and then start dribbling and backing down a defender just to draw some extra coverage and open up a guy now obviously 
uh, the Pelicans made the mistake by helping off of Jason Tatum to attack a Marcus Smart post up. That's just you should never do that. But Smart, you know, no many point guards put you in a position where you have to make that decision. So while Smart does have his limits, you know, his his three point shooting has been horrendous this year. His two point shooting in terms of pull ups hasn't been great. Obviously, he's done very well when drawing contact around the rim, finishing through contact. He's also doing things you wouldn't usually see out of a point guard, and that makes defenses react in ways that they usually wouldn't react. And that's benef- it's hugely beneficial. And then you go on to like playing the two guard. I mean, what's the what's the official name for the two guard? Shooting, shooting guard. guard. Yeah, what's the key word in that in that two word? Shooting it's not guard. <laughs> shooting. So Marcus Smart is not a shooter, and I think that's no slight on him because he does so many other things well. And you know, you, you, God doesn't give with both hands. So <laughs> you know, what I mean, if you're going to do all this other stuff, well, you're probably not going to be hitting shots too. Not everybody's that fortunate, and if you can do it all. You down well gonna probably be about six foot two and never be a superstar, you know. It happens. Jalen Brown can't defend too good. Jason Tatum is immense as a scorer and defender, but you ask him to sprint a break, he's not the fastest on the floor because why God doesn't want to make it too unfair. Tatum's still quick, <laughs> don't get me wrong. I'm just saying everybody has flaws in their game. So, like, you put Smart to two guard, of course he's going to take additional shots. Of course some of them are going to be stupid shots because it's Marcus Smart that's the guy that's taking the shot. But you put him in a position where his role is to shoot the ball. And then you you wonder why it's not working out. So, playing at the one is essential to me while this roster is constructed like this. Obviously, if he's next to a Kyrie Irving, you can play him at the two, give him the same playmaking responsibilities that he's got as a point guard. But he's got an outlet in Kyrie Irving at the time that can hit those shots or rip through off them, um, you know, go into the post, pass it out to perimeter, Kyrie rips through, gets to the rim, does ways, but you don't have that this year. So I think he's done the best with what he's got around him. And I saw someone the other day like, oh, well, he's only averaging like four or five assists a game. Like, dude, do you know how hard it is to get an assist on a team that doesn't hit shots? <laughs> I was going to say. Like, bro, <laughs> like, this team, like, seriously, there's been games where you literally wonder who put, like a magnet on the rim, like you know, like two positives sort of push the ball back away. I've been waiting to see that. Like, the, the, you can't get assists when the team ain't hitting shots, bro. I don't know what more you want. It's not like they're taking contested shots either. Most of their misses are from wide open looks, statistically. So, you know, you can't look at Smart's assist numbers and be like, oh, well, he's not doing too great as a playmaker. Well, yeah, if you look at the box score, but that don't tell you everything, man. No, and I think, honestly, I think. S- Smart season right now probably highlights all of the inefficiencies of the Celtics in the worst kind of way of they don't have a lot of shooting. And because their shooting has been really inconsistent outside of the Jays, they need more shooting around them. So asking Smart to play point guard is great, but not great if you really don't have any dependable options at the two. You know, you can you can slide Jalen in over there, and that's great. That's who you'd want there, ideally. But where else do you have shooting coming outside of Jason and Jalen? And you really don't have an answer for that. And I, I think mean, that's where... I mean, I mean, Josh Richardson's been okay in the mid range. Um, I mean, I liked Richardson. I do like him. But Grant Williams has been fantastic from the corners. Um, Lee Smith is meant to be good. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Point being is they need a third option, and I think that's really where the Celtics are at right now. I think people kind of misplacing that and putting it on Smart. That's not his role. His role is like being a primary playmaker. And considering the lack of shooting, he's doing pretty good. You know, it, by the time this drops, it's not going to be last game because by the time this drops, Miami will have played Boston and we'll, I guess, I we'll live with the results. Don't yeah, want to we'll, don't want to talk about it. But I will say that against the Pelicans, he did notch what, 12 assists? Yes, he did notch 12 assists. It was his third game of 10 or more assists this season. That's if not that's easy. That. In fact, I have the numbers. And again, please don't be like, oh, well, you know, he's played 40 odd games. He's only had three. Like, do people got to make shots for the assist to register? Yeah. So let me, let me find this. I'm just scrolling through my Twitter now because uh, I got into it a little bit. And po- okay, so Marcus Smart this season has had six games where he registered eight assists, three games where he registered seven, 10 games where he registered six, six games where he registered five. I stopped counting after that. I was looking at five or more and three games with 10 or more. So that's a good chunk. That's 28 games, including the three with his 10 plus games. 28 games this season where he's had five or more assists. For a guy that people were like, he's not a playmaker. Well, he's 
doing very, very well. I'm fine with running running the offense with him in as a primary facilitator for the rest of the season because I think you need a large enough sample size before deciding, hey, this doesn't work, so we need to go out and spend assets to get something that's going to work. Now, obviously, you can still go out and bring in uh, a scoring, facilitating point guard and slide, slide smart to the two. That's fine. But if you're like, hey, Smart needs to be part of this deal, we need to move on from Smart because it's not working, I would prefer a full season sample size because he's just played. If you'd asked me at the start of the season, I would be like, yo, you got to trade Smart, you got to trade Smart, is what it is. Now I'm kind of like, hey, you need to really give this guy a, a full season and then decide whether or not he can A, fit in as a two, B, be your sixth man and whether he's willing to be or see, yeah, it's worked, but it's not exactly what we want. His value is quite high. Let's cash it. Right. I think you need to wait until the end of the year to make that decision. Otherwise it's going to be a hasty one. Yeah. And I think right now that's kind of what the Celtics are in this point where you, you're, you clearly see them trying to get underneath the tax. And I don't think that you just move Marcus Smart to move him. You know, he's not necessarily the problem. Some people don't view him as the solution. I don't think anything involving the Jays or Rob or Smart is necessarily going to solve any of the issues that are at hand. If you can somehow make any kind of side moves that bring in shooting right now, or at least gets your youth out there, gets Aaron Neesmith minutes, gets Romeo Langford some minutes to try and build some shooting, to build some confidence, okay. So, so be it. So be it. At this point in time, like there, they should be in no rush to make like a massive move unless it is a surefire star and you're not forced to give up massive amounts of assets. And I really just don't think the Celtics are in that point, especially if they're trying to avoid the tax. And that's that's a conversation for another day. I don't like the tax idea, but is what it is. But Ain't no one want to pay taxes. Apparently not. I mean, I don't like paying taxes. Do you like paying taxes? I know. I don't like paying taxes. Do you look forward to it and be like, yeah, I get to give someone else my money. I definitely don't do that. Now, to be honest, you know, when everyone's like, oh, it's Whoop's money, it's, it's the ownership's money, I don't care what they spend. Like, that's cool, bro, but they care what they spend. Uh, the only way I look at it is, is that they plan on paying the tax in the next couple of years or yeah. next and season. And they also so. get a windfall as well. If they're not in the tax, they get a $10 million windfall, roughly, you know, from the tax paying teams. They're like, hey, here's some money. Of course you're going to do that. We're not contending. Get, I'll get a free $10 million. And that's the point too, right? Well, it, it, it waters down to that. Not okay, pretending. free. Like you're going to just give me ten million dollars because my team's not winning. Yes, please. I, I want ten million. Do you want not want ten million dollars? I'm not saying I want. I'm just. I'm just saying you're like basketball decisions. Tell me, like, hey, if you no. give me your worst pair of kicks, which is Dennis Schroeder, in instance, Ugh. I'll give you ten million dollars. I'm like, y'all take these kicks. Dude. You know what I mean? Give me my check. So I understand it. I really do. Right. I think that wraps us up because I'm, I've somehow managed to compare Dennis Schroeder to a pair of thrift store sneakers. Um, so we're going to leave it there. Uh, for everybody that's enjoyed the show, make sure to hit that like button, that subscribe button. Leave a comment. Follow Tim at Tim Shields NBA on Twitter. Follow me at Adam Taylor NBA everywhere that social media exists where basketball content is. You know, there might be a social media app. Cool. I don't know. You ain't going to find me on, like, oh, give me an after that you wouldn't find me on. I don't know. Parlor. <laughs> I don't know what that is. So, yeah. You know, oh, man. <laughs> Ask me off air. <laughs> okay, then. For everybody, you catch us later in the week. Hope you enjoyed your regular dose of Celtics content. Tim, say bye. Au revoir. <laughs>